Alrighty, so in today's lesson we're going to be looking at some of the scientists that contributed to Darwin's original theory of evolution. Uh, so before we get to that big theory there, uh, we have to get through some of the background guys. Uh, but before we get to that, we're going to go ahead and do a warm-up as we would normally do in class. So you're going to have a chance to stop the video here and answer these three questions before we move on. You may use your notes like we normally would do, that is totally fine, to help me answer these here. All right, now that we've had a chance to go through those, okay, um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of the uh, early scientists that shaped Darwin's theory of evolution. So the first guy that we're going to look at is James Hutton. Okay, James Hutton, he uh, actually has a nickname of the father of modern geology. Uh, that's because he's one of the first people to establish geology as like a credible science. Uh, and one of his first ideas that he proposed was that Earth is shaped by these geological forces that take place over extremely long periods of time. So, remember during this time, uh, special creation was like the big idea for how life in Earth originated, okay? So people thought that the Earth was only a couple thousand years old. So this idea that James Hutton came up with estimates the Earth to be millions and not just thousands of years old. So scientists started looking at the creation of Earth as a longer process than was originally thought. Um, and this kind of helped to shape Darwin's theory of evolution, showing that life had existed for a very long time, and these changes take a very long time. So there's no way that it could have only been around for a thousand years because it takes longer for those changes to happen. Um, Another uh, scientist that contributes to uh, this idea of changes happening over time is Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He's a French guy, if you can't tell from his name. Okay. Um, he came up with this idea called the inheritance of acquired traits. And now what the inheritance of acquired traits says um, is that parents can pass on traits to their offspring based on whether they use them or not. So a lot of times we use this giraffe example to explain that. So here on the left side of our picture here, we have a shorter giraffe, okay? And their particular food source is these shorter bushes, okay? So they don't have to be tall in order to get their food, so they're not gonna pass on any tall traits. Whereas these guys over here, okay, on the right side of our picture, um, they started off small, but over time, their food source was up higher. Okay, they have to eat leaves off of trees. So their legs are going to grow longer for them to be able to reach their food source. So what Lamarck said is that their offspring are going to inherit those traits directly from them. Okay. Now, if you're looking at that and thinking, well, that's nothing what we talked about, okay, you would be 100% correct. Um, but Lamarck was one of the first scientists to really try to explain evolution or explain changes in a species over time. Okay. So he thought that these organisms would gain or lose features whether they use them or not. Um, and then they could pass those traits on to their offspring, which we now know is not 100% true. Okay, this was eventually proven to be wrong and this idea was just completely discarded from there. Okay. Um, so it's important to remember that features gained during someone's lifetime are not passed on to their children. Okay. So a simple way to think about um, Lamarck's ideas of inheritance is to think like, okay, if you were to like cut your finger off in an accident, okay, then your kids aren't going to have that finger either because that's a trait that you acquired in your lifetime and it gets passed on to your kids which we now know is not true, but it was one of the very first attempts to explain how traits could be um, changed and passed on over time through generations like that. Another uh, geology kind of related guy was uh, Georges Cuvier. He is also French, again, from that name. Okay, um, He actually established this method of identifying fossils and stuff called comparative anatomy. So comparative anatomy is when you compare um, 
fossils that you find to maybe other living things in order to classify what those animals are. Um, so we'll get to classification a little bit later this year, um, but Cuvier's ideas eventually shaped the and fine-tuned that method of classification. Um, so because of this, he studied a lot of fossils in trying to identify old uh, organisms, stuff that lived a very, very, very long time ago. He is given the nickname of Father of Paleontology. Um, so I, whenever I think of paleontology, I always think of like Ross on Friends, how he always liked to uh, study fossils. He worked in a museum, okay? George Cuvier probably would have got along very well with Ross, okay? Um, he also believed this idea called catastrophism. So catastrophism is this belief that uh, catastrophic extinctions and catastrophic events happen, which is what causes changes to happen in a population over time. So to kind of put it in like, think about your dinosaur extinction, okay? Um, basically what he said, okay, is di yes, dinosaurs were probably there. And then some mass extinction event happened, a catastrophic event happened in order for those dinosaurs to go extinct. And then that area eventually repopulated. But after that repopulation, those organisms don't look the same way that they did. So we have organisms that kind of share some kind of characteristics that we believe dinosaurs may have had, but they don't look exactly alike. Okay. Um, so he said that those uh, organisms that survive after that catastrophic event repopulate that area and they take over that place, and that gives the appearance of change through time. Okay. So there wasn't, according to him, there wasn't exactly uh, gradual changes over time. Some crazy event happens, which causes a big change to happen at once, and then we see that, a ch that change immediately after that. So really, Cuvier did not support theories, the same theories of evolution as Darwin did and other scientists did. Um, he uh, was the first scientist to, propo to propose the ideas of mass extinctions, um, but uh, that ended up not carrying on into Darwin's theory of evolution. So it kind of helped shape it, but not completely. Another uh, guy, Thomas Malthus, he's not technically a science scientist, he's more of a social scientist, so he uh, was an economist during this time period, so he studied like populations and population demographics and how um, people change over time. And, and he noticed that babies were being born at a really, really fast rate, okay? We're starting to have more kids than people are dying off. It's kind of a morbid realization, but he started to realize, like, okay, we've got a lot more people than we did. How are we going to support these people? Uh, so he said if this continued, sooner or later, we're not going to have enough land or food to really support these people and support how many people are being born at this time. So he was the first person to coin the term carrying capacity. So carrying capacity is a limit on a particular area based on food and space to live and other resources like that. So the carrying capacity is the maximum number of organisms that a particular area can support. Okay. So if the carrying capacity is like a thousand organisms, say like in a forest, a forest can hold a thousand deer. It has enough resources to support a thousand deer. If you go over that thousand, okay, the population is going to drop way down because there's not enough resources to support anything over that thousand. Um, so Malthus kind of suggested that we see changes in these populations over time because of this, this carrying capacity, because we usually reach points where we don't have enough resources to support those things, and then they eventually 
die off and then they have to change and adapt to uh, use new resources or something like that. Um, so Darwin started to take little pieces and parts of all of these ideas and eventually put them together into his own theory of evolution um, to explain how these changes happen over time. Now, the last guy that we're going to talk about today is uh, Charles Lyell. He was another geologist, um, and Charles Lyell stated that the same processes that shape the Earth today were at work in the past. Um, so this is now known as something called uniformitarianism. So uniformitarianism says that these processes take a very, very long time. So he also proposed that the world was super ancient, not just thousands of year old, kind of like James Hutton. So his idea was very similar to James Hutton. Um, so he kind of threw out that idea that the earth was only thousands of years old and used evidence from rocks and fossils and stuff to say that there is no way that this stuff could have just formed over thousands of years. It takes a very long time. So the processes that currently shape our world were the ones that shaped the earth way back when, when it first started. Um, so this idea was actually the exact opposite of George Cuvier's idea of uh, catastrophism. So this kind of was an attack in a way on the belief among scientists that major catastrophes or supernatural events are things that shaped Earth's surface and the populations found on it. So Charles Lyell really probably would not have gotten along with George Cuvier very well uh, because they had uh, very much clashing ideas on how the earth formed and how populations change over time. Um, now the last thing that we're going to talk about here today isn't really necessarily a scientist, but farmers were people at this current time that kind of understood evolution and changes in species kind of a lot better than scientists did. Okay, so they knew, farmers knew that variation existed in populations, and those variations are passed to offspring. Okay, there are different traits within populations. Okay, um, so we can get different kinds of corn, we can get different kinds of wheat, and that kind of stuff. So farmers were the, some of the first people to use artificial selection. So artificial selection, uh, by definition, is an intervention by humans uh, that will ensure that individuals uh, that have desirable traits are the ones that get to pass on those traits, are the ones that get to produce offspring. Okay, So through artificial selection is how we have um, the corn that we have today. Uh, it's how we have the wheat that we have today. It's how we have a lot of the crops that we have today. Now, we kind of talked about in the last chapter how GMOs have kind of contributed to that, which they have, but before we even knew how to use GMOs and that GMOs were a thing, okay, artificial selection was the driving force in um, modifying uh, crops and things along those lines. Uh, farmers would also use this with breeding for um, animal agricultural purposes, so things like cattle and horses and things like that. Only the strongest horses or only the best cows that produce the best milk are the ones that they're going to use to breed with because those are the traits that they want in those offspring. Um, it's also how we got a lot of our domesticated dog breeds. Okay, um, So throughout the world, people have picked and chosen traits that they liked in order to get the thousands and thousands and thousands of different breeds that there are, um, and mixes of breeds and stuff like that. So um, you're kind of seeing a quick version of evolution happen with this selective breeding of these dogs. Um, so that was also something that helped to shape uh, Darwin's original theory of evolution. Um, so that is going to wrap it up for us today. Um, if you have any questions on anything for today, please let me know. Um, the next thing that you guys are going to be starting is going to be a project looking at the scientists. So please look at that description and email me if you have questions. Okay.
see you later.